So we have the May crew call. Um, we did our arrival. I think everybody arrived safely at home or wherever you are. Um, you know our agenda. Um, you also know that we always start our calls with a, a little observation uh, of nature. Um, today we have this uh, very colorful it is, right? shrub. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised. It was one of the first ones that I was introduced to when I came back to Austria, and I, of course, didn't know. There's a very colloquial name to it. Okay. I'll tell you later. Okay. Um, okay. But Gloria is gonna gonna resolve the Latin name at the end. So maybe Joan knows. Maybe Joan knows too. Yes. Um, but we 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 can discuss uh, in the end. Um, definitely very colorful. Um, so our, our next stop should be actually who, who is new. Um, I didn't prepare a slide, but uh, I have really good news. We have uh, a new school joining our project. It's, it's, a, it's a STEM focused middle school, so secondary education. And uh, we already received uh, a letter of intent to start the project with them uh, latest in fall, but maybe even uh, already in June. Um, so it's a local school uh, in St. Burton. Um, I move forward with the introduction. Um, we have we have actually two topics today um, um, that I that I would like to introduce. The first one is related to learning, and um, do you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Chat GPT. Yeah. yeah, so um, I have resisted till yesterday evening to use it. Um, but yesterday evening, I thought, why not try it? And I, I asked the question, what is the far goal of education? And I, I got a pretty substantial long answer, like you would expect it from a dictionary. Um, but I, I don't want to show you this answer today. Um, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the implication of such uh, machine learning uh, solutions on education. Um, but the answer that I want to give you is actually from a man. Um, it's from um, Abraham Maslow. I think Russian born, but um, nationalized American psychologist. And Abraham Maslow was... Uh, researching a lot on human motivation and personality. And he wrote in 1964, a very interesting book. And he said, the far goal of education as for psychotherapy, family life, work, society, life itself is to aid the person to grow to fullest humanness. So in a word it should help him to become the best he's capable of becoming, to become actually what he deeply is potentially what we call healthy growth is growth toward this final goal. Um, everybody who has been with this project for uh, some time knows that uh, what we criticize mostly in the formal education system is that we do not live up to this goal. Um, we live in an industrial education system. And my assumption is that uh, chat uh, GPT and other such applications will have a tremendous impact on education, I would say, even over the next five years. Um, but uh, probably most people don't realize yet that this is the case. Um, and when we think about education, then what defines really what we do every day in schools is how we measure progress. So currently, we have uh, OECD program for international student assessment or short PISA. And PISA measures human beings in a very, very small spectrum of what they are capable of. It's an industrial spectrum. It actually is a, a sort of competence that is very similar to what machines can do because it was born during the machine age. It's part of the industrial revolution. And you see here the left side, PISA 2018, the top rated countries. Uh, Austria is here last in the top 30, I think. Um, you find your own country somewhere. 
um, China is first. Um, those who who know a bit about this, it's not all of China. It's only three cities or Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu, and Zhejiang, so the most developed areas of China. Uh, but China is leading this competitive measurement system. And um, if we want to have or move closer to what Abraham Maslow said, that it is about unfolding potential and uh, respecting the differences that we have in, in our capabilities, talents, and intelligences, then we need a different system to measure um, our learning progress. And there is one system um, that is called the triple focus. It was developed um, about 10 years ago by a psychologist and a system theorist, um, Daniel Goldman and Peter Senge. It's called the triple focus. We use it uh, in green steps. Um, there is an inner focus, helps us to understand ourselves. There is an other focus, helps us to understand others better. And there is an outer focus, which lets us navigate the larger world. And um, this month, we release something that has a big overlap with this concept on the R. It was already partly there, but uh, now it's sort of complete. And Valentin created, updated um, our beautiful uh, triple helix. And we have now a simplified slide to explain um, how we measure learning progress on the ARC with the so-called overarching badges. So you, you know already the, the red uh, impact planets, it's the red line. So this is uh, measuring what you as a learner, as an individual human being, uh, make progress uh, in terms of participation. You participate in an event. When we participate, you could say, you learn about many things, but in the end, it's, it's your own personal growth. Um, then we have the teal uh, line here, which is about facilitation. So when you guide others, when you mentor others um, on their learning, and this is definitely about the other, no? You, you need to um, also grow in your experience. You show that you have more experience in guiding others uh, in learning. And then the third uh, badge, which is new, is we call it currently the developer badge is uh, the yellow one. The yellow one in the past was the spirit animal, which you see on the bottom. It's still there, but we moved it into the badge section because it's rather static. No? It changes only when you change uh, your age. Uh, so we keep our spirit animals. They're super nice. But we have now a dynamic third badge, which is the developer badge. And what is this about? It is about our growing understanding of a local environment. If we map natural features in our commons, in our bioregion on a continuous basis, um, then we collect development impact points and we get an impact mineral. So I'm um, uh, quickly switching to my own profile. And um, you see, I have all three badges on my profile. You don't have them automatically in your profile. And if you click on the badges, you see uh, always a, a little context help that explains uh, what this badge is about. So nothing has changed about the impact points, but uh, I see just now that I should probably switch to English. Nothing has changed about the uh, impact planets, about participation. Nothing has changed about the impact trees in terms of uh, guiding others, but this is new. Um, and uh, Gloria came up with this uh, categories. You want to say a few words on it? Yeah. So we have defined this as a with a seven classification system for minerals. So like uh, geologists define minerals into these seven classes, which are based on their symmetric axis. For example, like and they they change based on the complexity of those on the number of those axes. So if you think about the copper. Uh, which is part of the cubic system. You can see that the symbol is actually a cube. And the cube is uh, as something like three symmetric axes, while the turquoise, which should be the last one, has almost no symmetric axes. So this is more or less how is it 
changing. And uh, we use the, the name of uh, one mineral, which is part of a class, to to give it, to define the class. Like we are not uh, because the name uh, itself, like the geological name, it would be very complex. But giving it uh, just a simple name of one of the most known represented uh, mineral of the classes, we thought it somehow easier and more understandable. Yeah. So I'm checking out now what I have. I have a quartz yeah. in development. Um, so I have already uh, contributed 300 or more hours in uh, mapping uh, the natural environment. Um, 300 more hours, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a, a number of uh, trees that I've mapped. But we could also say that this mineral is really showing how much you have contributed to build the Internet of Nature in your learning space, in your nature learning space. It's really showing that you are actively engaged uh, in building this nature learning space, wherever you are. Okay, so this was the first part um, that we wanted to show and where I wanted to give a bit of a theory background, but we have actually something much uh, more exciting uh, to show today. And um, I'm switching back to my slides and I'm gonna go into gamification Measurement of learning progress is definitely something that will uh, grow in importance in the next few years. And there will be certainly a lot of discussion uh, how we can switch away from PISA. So maybe we have here uh, a good concept. But what is also important is how to uh, create engaging learning experiences. And you know that we work on gamification. Um, and what you have seen in the past is that one of the gamification elements that we have here is that the mobile phone is a tool to map trees, currently only trees, but this will also change in future. You map them, you can talk about those elements, you can discuss them. Uh, through the discussion, you make them more visible, also through the mapping, and it helps to protect some of those maybe threatened elements of nature. You then can collect them and you can learn. You can decide to um, learn more information by, for example, nav navigating uh, to the species information of a specific uh, nature element. W what uh, Lucas and Gloria show you today is uh, how we have improved uh, collecting, collecting natural elements. And we have here a benchmark that you probably have also seen. Um, when you observe children in school, then you see that they collect different cards. Um, quite popular is this uh, American uh, company. I think it's called Tots or Tops. Tops. Um, they um, print and publish uh, football players from around the world, and they are. Uh, featured as superstars. No? They have powers, defense powers, attack powers, power play. You see where they play, in which club they play, in which league they play. And the kids suck this knowledge up in a really sponge-like manner. Um, and our intention is to convert, to translate this, uh, this, um, yeah, this atmosphere. It's a sort of an, uh, a setting into, into trees. So how can trees become superheroes in our immediate environment? All right, that was the intro here. And with this, I'm handing over to Lucas and Gloria. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and uh, it's started. Um, so as Knut mentioned, we are trying to make nature observation into a gamified experience through collecting cards. Um, but we have an online platform. So how can we get to this feeling of a collectible card? We just try to recreate something similar in the digital environment. So if you are familiar with the arc a little bit, you know that after participating in nature walks in which you are observing nature elements, you grow your bioregional identity. So you get this percentage on uh, your profile and after you enter, you can see how many species and specimens you have observed. And then if you go into the specimens, 
you can see what are the concrete specifics, specific parts of nature that you have already discovered and which, are, which ones are still locked. So for the ones that you have discovered, you now obtain a digital card. And I have one open in here that I want to show to you. So we change the design of the mobile view of the specimens that you have collected to resemble a um, collectible card. Uh, the layout has the picture as the most prominent uh, part, then uh, the bioregion emblem. So this is a PA12 bioregion that we are in, in here. For each bioregion, we will create one uh, specific logo to give it a distinguished uh, look. Then the commons uh, logo. So each commons, each, uh, let's say, territory in which uh, people are um, taking uh, care of the nature and uh, uh, collect and mapping and collecting specimens. So this is the logo of the St. Paulton uh, commons. Then you can see the age of the, of the tree, uh, the girth of the tree, so the diameter at breast height, and the height of the tree. Then the name, the code, the species, which then you can click through and uh, navigate to the details about this species. And then the superpowers. So we don't have um, attack or defense, but uh, our superpowers are the ecosystem services that uh, the trees provide. And uh, yeah, Gloria, would you like to shortly uh, describe what uh, ecosystem services we have chosen to, to show? Yeah. So until today, we were showing, I think, three ecosystem services, and now we came up with five. I will start explaining from the first one, which is the CO2 sequestration by lifetime of a tree. So we all know like uh, about climate change and the fact that there is a carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is uh, greenhouse gases, and this causes global warming. So TLC trees are actually able to absorb these carbons from the atmosphere and store it into their trunks and branches and roots. And uh, in this way, they, they actually limit the CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is a great superpower that they have. Uh, the second point is uh, you see this bluish um, yeah, snow <laughs> snowflake. This is cooling power. So also in this case, talking about uh, global warming, we know, like, we all have experience like walking in cities during summer, which we get super hot. But in the moment in which you actually find a tree, you can cool down. And this is due to two main reasons. One is because of the shade, which actually has a re really big effect on people just walking below. But there is also another cooling process happening between the leaf and the crown, which, uh, it is also very important, let's say, and um, yeah, for different reasons. And um, the other F, the other uh, power would be bio uh, biodiversity richness, and uh, this um, refers to the number of animals, which can be um, birds, insects, also mammals, uh, um, worms, all depending on trees. Like uh, trees are very important to maintain a healthy ecosystem. Otherwise, without them, those animals would not have an area where to live. Birds would not have branches where to nest. So it's they're just uh, and based on different species are also different animals which are dependent on them. So it's important both like having trees, but also which species you are actually planting. Uh, another power that trees have. It's the storm water runoff avoided. So we, when it's actually raining in a city, if there are no trees, if there are no, is no soil, but only asphalt, the water will just touch the ground and fastly um, flow into big water bodies like rivers and then go to the sea and taking with it like pollutants as well. 
uh, but with uh, trees, we, we are actually able to intercept those uh, rain, like into the crown, but also to just store the water into the soil. And in this way, we can avoid floods, but we can also, but yeah, and it's also very good so that we have uh, water storage to irrigate fields, for example, and uh, also for drinkable water can be useful. Um, the last power that we are referring to is uh, air quality. So in the, this is about the ability of trees to intercept pollutant and particulate matter. I don't know if you are aware that the particulate matter, which is smaller than 2.5 uh, mic microns, is actually very bad for people's health, which can cause respiratory and vascular problems. And but trees in the, yeah between their crowns and stems they can intercept those kilos apparently of this particular matter, and improve the water the the hair quality. Cool. So five superpowers um, that can be compared among trees, and uh, then we all get to know more about why trees are uh, important uh, um, in the nature around us. Okay, so this is a digital card. So we are not limited to two sides. We've got three sides in here. On the second side, in the description, we get the information about the nature and about the culture. And so here you can find out why this tree is called uh, the elephant. And uh, the third tab is referring to the location where you can see uh, the location of the tree on the map. Cool. So, any Great. comments? Yeah. Um, any comments? Cool. If not, we continue. Um, Gloria, then it would be about uh, the citizen science 2.0, the new fields that we have in, yeah. um, in the species. Okay. So maybe you, you want to share with people. Yeah, so maybe I, I will just continue sharing the screen and I will give the word to Gloria after a short introduction. So maybe you can think, why, how do we get those numbers? These are very specific numbers um, that we cannot just uh, get out of thin air. So we started to collaborate with uh, two institutions so far. One is the Technical University in Munich, and the second one is ITRI uh, in the US. And um, there are some input variables that are necessary to um, compute uh, these ecosystem services. So let's have a look uh, into editing this specimen and see what are the variables that are actually necessary to see all those numbers. And yeah, so maybe Gloria, you want to explain? Yeah, sure. So um, actually, you can in the context help also it actually it's explained somehow but uh, so what is important to collect when you are on the field the most the first thing you should do is uh, getting the circumference of the stem because this is also is used to calculate almost every each of ecosystem services but also to define how old is the tree for example uh, afterwards you should look at the soil ceiling percentage so below the crown, you look at more or less at the projection of the tree on the ground, and you see how much soil is actually growing around this stem, because and how much and how much of the soil is filled. So for example, if uh, this is a low number, uh, actually this was still not done because it's older. But this is we can mm -hmm. do it now. I mean, there is no we surface look... ceiling there. This yeah, is a, it's a there is no no really concrete ceiling in this park. We know the tree very yeah, well. It's so because you can add to zero. Yeah. So you would say that if there is this kind of uh, compressed uh, path, then uh, you don't count it as sealed yet? Mm, yeah, right. No, it's not totally sealed because it can still probably absorb some water. All right. So, and uh, what is about the crown light exposure? I don't think we can do it with this because we don't see the crown right now. But uh, this you see how many faces of the crown are in the light and how many are in the shade. So it, it's a number that goes from one to five. And if, uh, for, for example, only the top is light, then would be one. If uh, all the 
part of a tree is, is in light. So if it's like a urban tree growing in the middle of um, a park, then it would probably be five. So this tree and would be also a five. It is pretty freestanding. Yeah, it might be a five, definitely. Yeah, it doesn't look like there are many other trees growing around. So, yeah. For the biodiversity richness, we have actually a, a database now that is based on uh, the species more than the specimen. So in that case, yeah, it's our own research. I'm not sure what we have for but we today. could We could just, to show it also on mm -hmm. the card afterwards, uh, Lucas could switch back. We could just say it's a five. Yeah, and, um, yeah sure. It's a bit, yeah. yeah. And then we need to look into the condition of the tree. So is it the condition goes from excellent to a dead tree? Uh, it's also not very easy to define. So most of the time, if they have like a lots of green leaves and it look healthy, it would be good or excellent. And then yeah, dying it's also easy I think to decide to to define. The others in between, uh, you have to be a bit more expert. But I believe uh, it's possible just by uh, yeah having an idea and of what it is more or less. Because of course, the health of the tree would influence also the ability of a tree, for example, to, to get CO2, like carbon, to store its carbon, and, or like to grow leaves, to grow a big crown, and they will have an effect on ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. So let's choose here good. And before Lucas switches back to the mobile view, I want to say one thing. Um, part of the mobile campus project is that uh, we go with uh, children, secondary students, uh, teens, outdoors, and repeat this process over and over and over. It's really a hands-on experience. So the children that participate in this program, they really become quite professional, amateur uh, naturalists. Yeah. Um, and and, and all, all, all those measurements that we take, this is also a hands-on job where you really, through manual movement, manipulation uh, learn quite quite a lot and the science that sinks in later that's the good part about it one show the the mobile view now yeah so i will save it and i go back to the page of the specimen and so you see that um, the the thing that has changed in here is um, the biodiversity richness which is the main thing for the other things it will um, it's updated uh, periodically through uh, querying the uh, iTree API. Mm -hmm. I think what is also important for those who use this the first time, we decided to only show the numbers, no units. But if you want to know what units are being shown, then you mm -hmm. click on the symbol and you get uh, immediately a context help. And then you know what it is. No? What is 33? Well, it's okay. liters in this case. It's the easy one. Liter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because rainwater. Pooling is a more complex maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but but we, we don't go here into details. Uh, over time, uh, learners will become familiar with this. Good. <clears throat> so, that's this. And um, so for the next step, I can um, take the um, lazy picture load. So we made some improvements in the way that the specimens are loaded so that was the slowest part of the arc uh, so when i when i switch into the specimen stat in here in the past it could take maybe 10 seconds to load now it's almost instantaneous so it's a first uh, performance um, improvement that uh, we've done uh, about this there is more coming so I hope to share more with you next month and um... It, wherever you are, try this out. I mean, it's really bombastic here. It's really a, a, um, a significant um, improvement over over last week. Um, so try it out and, and tell us how, how things load. And this is, refers to everything, no? also to everything where there's a lot of data. Yeah, so there will, I will not go into details. Main thing is that um, only the pictures that you can actually see at the moment are being loaded. So not all the pictures. Yep, and uh, the next thing that we wanted to show to you is uh, giving credit to the best practice creators. So you might be familiar with the library of best practices where 
educators share to each other um, their, let's say, templates of activities. So it is a template with information, pictures, and pedagogical information. Um, so what you can do when you open a best practice, uh, you can create an activity out of it. So in the, up till now, after, when you were viewing such an activity, which was created from a best practice, there was no sign of it be, having been created from the best practice. So we have added a little window, little piece of information, which gives credit to the creator of um, the best practice that was used to create this activity. So I will open just the first one that we have in here, um, the genuine growth uh, series. And uh, if you scroll down a little bit, then uh, under the pickets, there is the information about which best practice it has been created from and who created the best practice. And you can directly navigate to it. So giving uh, credit to the best practice creator because it's um, quite a bit of work to create one in a useful way. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's it, I mean, the platform is all about meritocracy. Um, everybody who creates content and makes it available to others should be also at least respected in this manner. Um, yeah. Cool. And then uh, last but not least, um, we have created a manual for um, Commons mentors so that uh, the first steps on the platform are, um, let's say, a bit easier for them and require less of um, guidance from our side. So giving the credit here to, to Gloria and Knut. And um, Gloria. Gloria, mostly. OK. And um, if you want to check it out, then um, you just go to the homepage of the ARC, scroll to the very bottom, and uh, there is the section for community for Commons mentors. And um, from here, you have the access to to the manual, and you can directly open it uh, in the browser and uh, check it out. It's a PDF; can be also downloaded. So it uh, guides you through creating the account on the Arc, creating a community, creating a Commons. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Those three. <laughs> Yeah, this is the um, beginning of uh, our efforts to better document what is um, what is possible with the platform and give, give people better guidance than just having to self-explore in the platform. Yeah, that's it from, from my side and from all the news of this month. Great.